Well, good morning, Beartown Road Alliance Church. So grateful that you could join us for our online worship service. I know many of you small groups are meeting together. Maybe you're gathered with a friend. Uh, Maybe you're meeting outside. Maybe you're inside, uh, wherever you might be. Just grateful uh, that you could meet with us and, uh, and worship our King together. Hey, next week, next week, July 5th, uh, we're going to worship on site. We're going to meet in our worship center for the first time since like March 15th. It's been forever. And we are looking forward to finally being able to gather together on a Sunday morning. So stay tuned for the worship times and all of the details. We're going to let you know those details this coming week so that we can prepare for you to gather and descend upon this place. We're really excited about that. Also wanted to let you know about Summer Blast Off. Um, Summer Blast is the biggest event that we do all year. Unfortunately, this year, we can't do it on site, but we are going to do it online. And again, we're calling it Summer Blast Off because it's a little bit off. And you can see I got got the Summer Blast Off t-shirt going on right now. Summer Blast Off. You know you want one of these new t-shirts, don't you? That's right. Summer Blast Off is happening July 13th, 14th, and 15th. It will premiere on Facebook and YouTube Uh, at 11 a.m., and then it will be available for you on demand if you want to invite some people over and meet later in the evening if you're not able to meet at 11 a.m. We're just, we're hoping that you'll take advantage of this. I know the staff has worked very hard. We've got volunteers who've worked very hard to be able to provide this for you, Um, and we still want to give you a great experience of kids memorizing verses, uh, kids raising money for the children's hunger fund so that we can just provide some food and provide the gospel for kids all around the world who are hurting. We're really, really excited about this program, and I hope that you will have your kids involved, and maybe you'll consider inviting some friends over your house to be able to participate in Summer Blast. We're really, really excited about that. Hey, today we are finishing off our series, Not Today, Satan. And Rob Finch, Pastor Rob's going to finish off this series today. And uh, there's a verse in Revelation 12, verse 10, where... Uh, John, the apostle who wrote the book of Revelation, says, For the accuser of our brother, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. Right? Speaking of Satan, the accuser, the one who speaks lies, he's been hurled down. He's been defeated. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So one of the ways that we say, not today, Satan, It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. We know that the cross defeated Satan, yet God has still given him a leash, given him a certain amount of authority. But he gets defeated by the cross of Jesus Christ and the word of our testimony. For us to be able to say, this is what Jesus has done in my life. And it takes the power out of Satan's bite. I love the song that we're going to sing. This This is one of my favorite songs. I've been jamming to this song the last few months. I love it. It goes like this. I saw Satan fall like lightning, and I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over is my name is registered in heaven. That my name is written in the book of life because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And that is great, great news that we celebrate today. This is my testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story, and I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I am justified, or I'm made not guilty, or I'm forgiven. This is my testimony. So the worship team is going to lead us in this song, and I hope that you will enter and I hope you will sing out because God has done a great work in our lives. God has given us the victory over Satan and the powers of darkness. And he has enabled us to be able to say, not today, Satan. You were defeated at the cross. And when Jesus comes again, eventually Satan will be defeated once and for all. But in the meantime, in the meantime, I'm going to be able to say, not today, Satan, because of the cross and because of my testimony that I have been saved by grace. And it has broken the power of sin and death and the power of Satan. So let's sing this out together. Let's worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he is worthy. Let's sing together. I saw Satan fall like lightning 
I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven. Oh, my praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from day to life. Because Christ rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'll testify. This is my testimony. This is my testimony Come together sons and daughters Born with blood and washed in water Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father Our God will finish what He started Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause Christ rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Dead and you not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead and you not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead and you not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. I'm not dead, you're not done. Great things are still to come. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause Christ rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'll justify. This is my testimony. Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony.
doubt that comes on strong He is stronger For every battle that we face He has conquered all More than we can know Our promise is Jesus Our answer is Jesus
So teach my song to rise to you. The when temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I fall on you. And Jesus, show my hope and stay. So teach my song to rise to you. Temptation comes my way, and when I can, I stand. I fall on you, Jesus. You're my hope and stay. confession that we need you we're not going to attempt to make decisions on our own apart from you because we know you're the perfect leader and you have a perfect plan we put our trust in you this morning we just invite you again to increase your presence in our lives and we will be aware of you we will listen to you we will follow you we'll be a people who reflect your love your ways we pray that you'll fill us again this morning. Renew us. Make us clean and fresh. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We are your people. You are a perfect father. We just love you and we give you praise this morning. And it's in your son's mighty name we pray. Amen. Good morning, and it's good to have you with us again this morning, and it's my privilege to once again open the Word of God and speak to you in Dave's behalf, uh, taking this last two parts of this sermon series that uh, Dave has been leading us through, uh, Not Today, Satan, uh, from Ephesians chapter 6, looking at uh, putting on the whole armor of God because of the spiritual warfare that we're in, and uh, Pastor Dave gave me the responsibility uh, of taking the last two parts of this message series. One was a piece of the armor that we have to put on, and the other was the, the final instruction from the Apostle Paul in that particular chapter. But, uh, and that will end this series. Next week, we're really looking forward to gathering together here in the Worship Center live. And so hopefully, if you can make it out and you're well enough and feel like you can, you can do that, we'd love to finally start having some face-to-face -face, uh, conversations and um, live worship and... Uh, live preaching of the Word of God, and we'd love for you to be a part of that with us. Our scripture text from last week was uh, these verses from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Uh, we did the first part where Paul said, take the helmet of salvation and the sword 
of the Spirit. And we talked about that. The sword of the Spirit, he said, is the Word of God. And uh, that was, that was a, real, it's a really important part of a spiritual life, as is the next part, praying in the Spirit. And he says doing it all the time, but praying in the Spirit. So these two ideas are key. They are essential to our Christian life. Not just the spiritual warfare, but just to every aspect of our Christian life. Growing in the Lord, learning more about the Lord, following Christ, um, um, honoring God with our lives. All of these things really come out of these two responsibilities of carrying the sword of the Spirit in our heart, in our lives, the Word of God, and praying in the Spirit as well. We said last week that both of these things are, uh, the common denominator is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He gave us the Word of God. He spoke to holy men of God, and they, they uh, wrote down the Word of God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that illuminates the Word, lights up the Word into our heart and lives so that we can understand what it is we're reading. And the Holy Spirit then leads us in our time of praying. And both of these things are also acts of communication. When we want to hear from God, we've got to get into God's Word. That's what communicates to us God's will, God's way, what God wants us to do with our lives. And then our praying in the Spirit, again with the help of the Spirit, is, is our communication back to God about what He's talked to us about. So there's a two-way communication going on here, and uh, both of these things are are key together. We're going to think about just that second part this week, praying at all times in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Paul says, praying at all times in the Spirit. And we do that with all prayer and supplication. Um, with, with all of our kinds of praying that we do, we need to be doing it in the Spirit at all times. And with all of our supplications, that's praying for other people, um, we need to be doing that at all times in the Spirit. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance. Just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said to the disciples, stay awake, watch, be alert. I'm going to go on a little farther, I'm going to pray. But you need to be alert. Do you ever fall asleep praying? It's kind of embarrassing, especially if there's other people around when it happens. But I've done that. Uh, it just seems like a natural time after a busy day. You close your eyes, you, you want to talk to the Lord in prayer, and all of a sudden you end up falling off to sleep. So he says, be alert when you're doing this with, with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And then he gets personal. And as for me, Paul says, that words may be given to me that, in opening, that I may open my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel of which I'm an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So he's praying the will of God over his life. He knows what the will of God is for his life. Today we're going to talk about the will of God for your life. We can know it generally. Everyone has the same will of God for their life, generally speaking. We know what that is. It's in God's Word. And then sometimes some of us get to know specifically along the way how, generally, how God's general purpose in our life is fulfilled in specific ways. Paul was fortunate enough to have the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, tell him specifically, Paul, this is what you're going to do and bringing honor and glory to me. So he knew. He knew what he had to do. And he was soliciting the prayer of the saints that they would join in with the Holy Spirit of God and be bringing his life before the Father that uh, he may do exactly what he's been commissioned to do, that he might do it boldly without fear and say the right things at the right time. So this morning we're talking about the war room. That's the message title for us today, the war room. A few years ago, there was a Christian film that came out which was called War Room. And it was about a, an elderly lady that had a special room in her house, just about the size of a closet. And in this room, when she brought a realtor one, one day and she showed the realtor around the house, she said, this is my special room. This is my favorite room. And uh, she opened the door for the realtor and there was just this closet, not very large, with a chair and a desk. And on the wall in front of that desk were pictures and charts and names of people, and requests for prayer. And it, it was her place where she did battle with the enemy by going in the Spirit in that place and praying on behalf of other people. And she called that her war room. The war, a war room, is a, in reality, is a room at a military headquarters 
where the generals and the lead commanders would get together and they would observe the current status of the troops, where they were at, and they would pull out the maps and they would study the terrain and they would make decisions regarding the battles that they were, that they were facing. It's also used for corporations, a, a business room in a, in, a, in a corporate headquarters where the heads of the uh, corporation, the CEO and others would gather together and they would strategize about their company, uh, what they were going to do and they would hold conferences there and they would, they would uh, plan specifically using charts and maybe some maps and computers and getting those things out. It's in the war room where the battles are really won or lost. And we've been talking in context about the warfare, the spiritual warfare that we're in. And as we think about the war room, we're thinking about it now in the context of the battle that we're in. And the war room is, is our time spent in prayer. We're talking about this phrase, praying in the Spirit. And just like last week, I want to give you three points. We want to discover what it means to, to, to pray in the Spirit, and we're going to do it in these three ways. Jot these down, and as we're going through the message together, it will help give you um, an outline and understanding of where I'm going and how things fit together. Number one, we want to discover what it does not mean. What praying in the Spirit does not mean. Okay, We'll do that first. Then we'll follow that with what it does mean. Once we've eliminated what it isn't, then we want to talk about what it is. And then lastly, we want to talk about how we do it. How is it that we actually pray in the Spirit. So, step one. Praying in the Spirit is not. And um, let me list some things of what the praying in the Spirit is not. It's not the prayer of an unbeliever. It's not the prayer of an unbeliever. In, in Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul tells us that the things are God, the things of God are under, made known to us through the Holy Spirit, and that's how we understand them. He says, uh, the things that God has revealed to us through the Spirit, the Spirit searches everything. Yea, the Spirit even searches the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit, small s, of that person, his, his own human spirit. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Paul says, now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but we have received the Spirit who is from God that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And he says, we impart these things and wisdom that the Holy Spirit gives to us. He says, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. But then he says, the natural man, the unsaved man, the unbeliever, the person who does not have the Holy Spirit of God in his life, he cannot understand these things because the Holy Spirit is not present in his life. And it's the Holy Spirit that helps us understand the things of God. So the prayer of an unbeliever, unless it's the prayer of, Lord, save me, I need you in my life. And that would be a spirit, that would be a prayer that would be directed by the Spirit in his life. But unless it's that prayer, it, the prayer of the unbeliever is not praying in the Spirit. And it's not always even the prayer of a believer. It's not even always the prayer of a believer. I know that to be true in my life, and I sadly confess that truth that not every time that I pray, am I praying in the Spirit. I wish that it were true all the time, but the reality is our flesh is weak. Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And, and oftentimes, we're really not praying under the direction of the Holy Spirit. We find ourselves praying because it's the right thing to do, and it is. We find ourselves maybe praying because there are set times and day we, we pray, and those are good things, and I wouldn't diminish that. But those aren't always opportunities where we're actually praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is not necessarily your regular times of prayer. A lot of us have regular times of the day that we pray. Uh, maybe it's first thing in the morning. Certainly during meal times, a lot of times families get together and they, they pray a bit. Maybe at nighttime for you tuck your kid, when you tuck your kids into bed at night, you might spend some time praying with them. Or maybe when you go to sleep, that becomes a prayer time for you. But just because we have regular regimented times that we go before the Lord in prayer, and that's a good thing, doesn't always mean those are times that we're spirit-filled and the Spirit is leading our prayers. It, it, it's possible we're doing it just out of obligation more than anything else. Praying the Spirit is not reciting words, reading words, spitting back memorized words. It's not done by rote memory. I was preaching once in a church, a lady came up to me after, 
And she said, uh, you didn't use the Lord's Prayer. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, in, in our church, we always start with the Lord's Prayer. We, we say the Lord's Prayer every service. Uh, and I thought to myself, okay, yeah, so <laughs> praying the Lord's Prayer. The, the Lord's Prayer was never meant to be prayed. It was an instruction how to pray. In fact, Jesus in that passage in the, in the Gospel of Matthew says when you pray, and he says how to pray, he says don't use vain repetitions. And if we're just using the Lord's Prayer, memorized prayer, and that's how we pray, that's vain repetition. It goes against the very thing that Jesus was talking about. So it's not just memorized words. It's not written down beautiful flowing speeches that we want to call a prayer or things that are memorized. It's not praying or speaking in tongues as some people think. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, that sometimes in our praying, we don't have the right words. We don't know what to say. And then he says, the Holy Spirit takes our words and brings them to the Father. And, and he, he brings words that are, maybe are unknown to us. Or he, he murmurs in ways that we can't quite comprehend. And some people have interpreted that to, to mean that when we're praying, we might be praying in a mumble or a language that would be a prayer language. And that would be the Holy Spirit praying through us. But it, that's not what praying in the Spirit is. Because speaking in tongues, or even if you prayed in tongues, speaking in tongues was a gift of the Holy Spirit of God given to a few believers. Praying in the Spirit is an instruction of the Holy Spirit of God and given to every believer. So it, it can't be that. Uh, praying in the Spirit is not saying special holy words. It's not praying in the King James Version of the Bible. <laughs> Shakespearean English. I remember growing up praying, and the only prayers I heard were things like, Father, that thou wouldest let me to, you know, and, and using these archaic Shakespearean these and thous. And, and it wasn't until probably early on in my high school years, around 10th grade, I heard somebody praying in one of our church meetings, and he wasn't using these and thous and wouldests and, and all of those ty types of phrases that we find in the Old English Bible. And he was just using regular, normal, common language. And sometimes people will just use everyday common language, and all of a sudden when they pray, all of a sudden it's back to Shakespearean English, as if there's a special prayer language that we have to have. And that confuses people. Why do I have to pray that way? We don't. Or it's not using special theological terms. When you're praying, it's a good place to throw in justification or imputation or, you know, some of these theological terms. It's not using theological terms. Praying the Spirit is not praying in the flesh. And I think, and I think about my life, a lot of times my prayer, sadly, is praying in the flesh. I'm doing it in my own strength. And I'm, I'm not really depending upon the Holy Spirit of God in my life. The flesh is weak. The flesh cannot do that. It needs to be the, the Spirit working through. The word prayer in our Bibles, as we, we take the, try to understand what the word pray means, and we, we boil it down from the, the Greek grammar of the, the New Testament scriptures, and we find out what that word pray literally means. You know what it literally means? Pray. That's the way it's translated, because that's the way it's supposed to be. Or to wish, or to desire. The dictionary says a prayer is a solemn request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God. And again, it says, an earnest hope or wish. So that's what prayer is. Now, when we pray in the Spirit, the important word is that word in. Because that word means by means of, or with the help of, or in connection to. So when we are praying in the Spirit, we are expressing our desires and our wishes and our hopes to God by means of and by direction of and by leadership of and under the influence and power of the very Holy Spirit of God, who knows what is the very heart of God himself. And that's why praying in the Spirit becomes very important. So, point number two, discovery number two, we know what it is not, then what is it? I did a lot of research, read a lot of articles, read a lot of commentaries just on this verse, and, and gathered lots of information of what different people had to say about this phrase, praying the Spirit, what it means. And I put together a bunch of them. I want to share them with you. Mostly just one-liners. The first one is the largest one. And after that, they're just statements. But you're going to see a, a common flow throughout all of these, these uh, thoughts. 
Uh, one person said, God the Holy, it, uh, praying in the Spirit is God the Holy Spirit talking to God the Father in the name of God the Son, and the believer's heart is the prayer room, or what we're calling the war room. It's where the strategy takes place. It's where you know, things are thought about and developed and, and plans laid out. But it's God the Holy Spirit talking to God the Father in the name of God the Son. So we have to do a little bit of theology here. We're talking about a triunity. We're talking about the Trinity. We're talking about God being three in one, that there is one God and there is only one God. But God is in three distinct individual persons known as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And these three individual persons together make up the one God. And as three individual persons, they have fellowship with each other. They talk to each other. They communicate with each other. And many people don't quite understand this, but within the Godhead, even though they are all equal because they are all God, there is order of uh, subordination. There is headship. The Father is always at the head. The Son is second and the Spirit is third. The Father sends the Son to be the Savior of the world. And the Son always does the will of his Father who is in heaven. And it takes the Father and the Son together. And Jesus says to his disciples, when I go, my Father and I, I'm going to pray to my Father, I'm going to ask my Father, and we together will send to you the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit may be with you. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, will glorify himself, and he glorifies the Father. So there is an order of submission within the equality of the three divine persons of the one God, the Trinity. So this praying in the Spirit is the Holy Spirit praying through us to God. It's important. Another person said prayer with divine help, God's help. It's trusting in faith and relying on God to hear, understand, and act. Now, the faith part is important. It's not faith that whatever I say, that's what God's going to do. This is praying um, about the requests that I bring to God, that God is going to hear them. I have faith that God's going to hear them, and I have faith that God's going to understand what I'm saying. And if I am praying them correctly in the will of God, then I have faith that God is going to be able to respond properly because it is his will to begin with. And that's where the praying comes in with faith, relying on God to hear, understand, and act, and it takes the Holy Spirit's help for that. Praying in the Spirit is relying on the Spirit in prayer. Totally relying on the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is praying in the power. That word means ability. Praying in the power or the ability of the Spirit and by the leading of the Spirit and according to His will. There are three things that are important. His ability, His leading, and we're praying according to His will. And the will of the Holy Spirit is always the will of Jesus and the will of Jesus is always the will of God the Father. So it's about praying in God's will. Praying in the Spirit is praying for things that the Spirit leads us to pray for and would be willing to pray for himself. Why? Because he is. When we're being led in prayer by the Holy Spirit, the, the things that are going from our heart to God, when we're expressing the will of God in our lives, and wanting God to glorify himself in fulfilling his will, that is the Holy Spirit willing to pray himself because he always wants the will of God to be done. You know, sometimes when we pray, we don't like the will of God the way it's accomplished in our prayer. He didn't do it the way we wanted. He didn't do it the way we expected. He didn't do it in the way we thought it should be done or the timing it should have been done. And a lot of times our prayer life is like, Father, it's really my will, not your will, and therefore I'm praying to you that my will would be done. But when we're praying in the Spirit, it's not about us. It's always about God's will being done. Even in Jesus' prayer, at the end of the prayer that he taught the disciples, the pattern for praying, he says, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And praying in the Spirit always leads us into the will of God. Praying in the Spirit is simply amplifying the meaning and the significance. Whoops, I'm sorry. This one first. Praying in the Spirit is empowering the, the prayer and carrying it to the Father in the name of Jesus. Empowering our prayer and carrying it to God in the name of Jesus. And then this one, simply amplifying the meaning and the significance and the power of prayer. 
And I thought to myself that praying should affect some things in my life. It should affect my timing. That means um, how often I'm in prayer. Um, when I go to prayer, I find myself now in the career I'm in, not in full-time ministry anymore, but uh, in an occupation where I have some lots of alone time throughout the day. I find myself um, many times just talking to the Lord throughout the things I'm doing over the course of the day. And so timing for me is now becoming almost an, an everyday, all-day type of thing. The tenacity of prayer, how much we really go after something in prayer. The Lord teaches us to really just keep knocking on the door. Uh, those that knock, God is going to answer. If we're seeking, we will find. And then it, it also affects the topic of our prayer, what we pray about. Like I said, it's not about my will, but my prayers are bathed in what God wants to do in our lives. So we know what praying in the Spirit is not. And now we've discovered what praying in the Spirit actually is. It has everything to do with praying the will of God, which is why I said it was so important that we understand the Word of God. Because you don't know the will of God without being in the Word of God. And when the Word of God is in your life and you're following through with that, you know what the will of God is. So how do we pray in the Spirit? Five key ideas for us here as we think about praying in the Spirit. Five key spiritual principles for praying in the Spirit. Number one, be in God's Word to know what to pray. You've got to be in God's Word to know what to pray. There is a general will for God. We've talked about that. And there are specific wills for God in my life and your life. I know what the general will of God is for my life. And I actually know what the general will of God is for your life. Because the general overall will of God in creation is that you and I would bring honor and glory through our life to him in everything that we do. The Apostle Paul said, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we're to do it for the glory of God. When sin came on the scene and entered into our lives and passed on through all humanity, the Bible says all have sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. The very thing we are created to be and to do, we fall short of because sin in our lives. And that's where that battle comes in to get us back to the purpose that God created us for, to glorify him in all that we are. And then how, does, how, does, how do I glorify God in my life? Uh, how do I glorify God in my marriage? How do I glorify God in my career? How do I glorify God in raising children? How do I glorify God in where I live? Those become the specific dynamics that oftentimes we don't know in our lives. God doesn't share them with us. And we just trust in God each step of the way that in those moments in life, we are following God's will. So you've got to be in God's word to know what God's will is, to know how to pray. Secondly, be filled with the Spirit to know how to pray. That's another command of the Bible. Be filled with the Spirit. The word filled means be controlled. Allow the Holy Spirit to take control of your thoughts and your heart and your mind so that you're thinking the thoughts of God and you're speaking the thoughts of God. A few weeks ago, Pastor Dave used the verse that we would be speaking the very words of God. And he said that didn't mean we're walking around quoting Scripture. He says that means that the things that would be coming out of our mouth would be things that would be, would be pleasing to God, things that God would be saying himself if he were there in that situation speaking. So we need to be filled with the Spirit. Thirdly, we need to be motivated by the Spirit to be compelled to pray. To be compelled to pray. I read a testimony of a pastor who had a similar background to mine in his Bible college days. He was a married student in Bible college. Uh, he went to classes during the day, worked at UPS at night, just like I did. And uh, it's an exhausting day. You're in school, you're in studying, you get home, you have supper, you do some more studying, spend a little bit of time with the family. 11 o'clock at night, you head to UPS, you load trucks all night long, and then you start your trek back home about 4 o'clock in the morning. And you're kind of exhausted. And this night he was driving back home, 4 o'clock in the morning, and he just could not stay awake. He was slapping himself, I've done that, roll down the window, let the cool air in, cranking the music up really loud, do whatever you can to try to stay awake. He was doing, I've done that. And all of a sudden, he woke up in his driveway, in his car, parked, and he has no idea how he got there. Got into the house, and the bedroom light was on, which was unusual. 
and he walked into the bedroom and his wife was sitting up and she said, uh, how was your drive home? And he said, funny you should ask. And he told her what happened. And he said, why? She said, at four o'clock, I woke up from a sound sleep and I just had this urgency in my heart to pray for you. So I figured there must be something wrong on your drive home. So I've been praying for you ever since. And that guy felt like his wife saved his life in that moment because she was compelled to pray and she prayed. I've had people say, you know, if God's going to do this anyway, why do we need to pray? Because that's the way God does things. He wants to include us in what he is doing. It's a privilege to be included with what God is doing. And he chooses to use us and he continues to work through us and uh, accomplish his will through us. Um, number four, by persevering in the Spirit in how often you pray. Persevering. It's easy to get discouraged in prayer. You don't see things being answered the way you think they should be answered, and maybe you give up, maybe you stop. It's probably because we've been praying wrong. Praying in the Spirit means we're praying the will of God, and we persevere in it. And lastly, be confident for God's will that what you pray for will be done. What you pray for will be done only if you're praying in the Spirit, because what you're praying for is the will of God to begin with. See, praying is not name it, claim it. God's not Santa Claus in heaven with a list waiting to just give out gifts to anybody that asks. We become very selfish sometimes with our prayer life. It's all about what we want and we ask God for. And then we get upset with God when it doesn't happen. Um, be confident for God's will that what you pray for, this is praying in the Spirit, praying in God's will, will be done. Why? Because it's the will of God may not be done the way you or I think, but it will be the way that God thinks is best. There is a warning I have to share with you, and it has to do with praying. And sometimes we just don't know the outcome. We don't know specifically what God's will is going to be regarding the outcome of a prayer. We know generally what it's supposed to be, but we don't know specifically. And so we have to be careful. And this, this warning comes to us from Martin Lloyd-Jones, a famous Bible scholar, Bible teacher, um, a writer, and this particular book, The Final Perseverance of the Saints About Prayer, uh, was one of his books where, well, he was a powerful man of God in prayer anyway, and um, he gave us this warning. He says, do not, do not claim, do not demand, this is in your prayers, do not claim, do not demand, let your requests be made known, let them come from your heart, God will understand. Pray urgently, plead, use all the arguments, use all the promises, but again, he says, do not demand and do not claim. Never put yourself in the position of saying, if we but do this, then that must happen. Or if I do this, then God has to do this. And sometimes we, we come at God and we demand God to do things because we think God, it would be something that would be pleasing to God. Certainly it would be pleasing to us, and therefore, we kind of make demands on God, expecting God to do it. An example. I had a friend in South Africa years ago that told me the story of losing her husband. He had been shot in Johannesburg, where they had previously lived before I met, them, met her in Cape Town. Her husband had been shot in Johannesburg. He went to the hospital, very serious condition. She was praying that God would spare his life. Her church gathered around her, and said, we need to pray in faith that God will heal him. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they put all their faith into it, and she prayed, and she put all her faith into it, and she prayed and prayed for days on end that God would heal her husband, and he died. The result of that was she went away leaving God, leaving the church, how could God not answer my prayer? I thought if I ask in faith, you know, anything I ask in faith, God has to do it. He didn't answer my prayer. God, are you really there? God, do you really care? And she left, walked away from God, and she left the church family for years. And it wasn't until many years later, God brought her back. His Holy Spirit patiently worked with her and brought her back. And she finally came to a realization that, you know, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And that even um, praying for somebody's life, 
But if it doesn't turn out the way we want, we need to be praying for God's will, even in the circumstances of death. So we need to be praying. He goes on to say, God is a sovereign Lord, and the things and these things are beyond our understanding. Never let the terminology of claiming or demanding be used in prayer. I try to think of some practical ways in my life of praying God's will. What if I got a recent diagnosis of cancer and I was told I had a very serious cancer and I started praying about that? How should I pray? Well, I'm going to be praying, Father, um, I really don't want to die right now, or at least I don't want to die by cancer. And so I would be bringing my desires before the Lord. But at the same time, while I'd be bringing my desires for the Lord for longer life and for healing, at the same time, I would also have to say, but Father, if it's your desire for me to go through this, if the way you want me to honor you is to go through this difficult trial of cancer and maybe even eventual death, give me the grace to go through it. So it's praying our desire is yes, but we're not sure if that's what God's desire is. So we need to make sure we're praying God's will. And in that circumstance, it would always be God's will for me to bring honor and glory to him, even going through a serious illness or sickness. What about a person with a, with a sinful addiction? I've talked to a lot of people that uh, Christians love the Lord and they are plagued with a, an addiction in their life, a bad habit, they're trying to get rid of. And if they've seen some people go to God with their bad habit and God removes it just like that, then others, it doesn't happen that way. For some reason, God leaves them battling day in and day out that habitual sin in their life that wants to claim them and they have to fight against it every single day. And in going through that battle, if they go through that for the honor and glory of God, they become a, um, a, a person, a testimony of somebody else that's going through the struggles and still living for God, and God uses them in a unique way to encourage others. What about if you're coming into a crisis marriage and your marriage is heading for divorce? How do you pray about that? What is God's will regarding marriage? What is God's will regarding two people that have promised to, to, to love and cherish each other? How long is that marriage supposed to last? How does God feel about divorce? We take all of this knowledge of what God's will is and we put it into our prayer life and pray in such a way knowing that it would not be God's will for us to go through a divorce, but it would be God's will for us to work these things through forgiveness and reconciliation and confess and repent. That would be God's will. What about getting married in the first place? So many people don't get married anymore. They just live together. Christians are doing that. Is that okay? What does God's word say about that? What does God's word say about Sex outside of marriage. There is a will from God. There is a word from God. And when you and I pray, and we're bringing our request to God, and we're praying in the Spirit, we're praying the very thing that God wants us to address. We're agreeing with God in prayer. And we're asking for God's will be done in our life and for us to respond in such a way that it will always bring honor and glory to the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ, the testimony of our church, the testimony of the Word of God, and in praise to God Himself. Praying in the Spirit is important, and the sword of the Spirit is important. And together, those two things help us <clears throat> live God's Word out and have an effective, powerful Christian life. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you that you love us with a great love. I thank you that you placed us all on earth with the purpose of bringing honor and glory to you. There are many different ways we can do that. And we all do it in many different ways. And some of us are very unique in the ways that we do it. But we have that same task. And I pray that you will have us pursue that. You will have us pursue honoring you and bringing glory to you with, with all of our lives, our, our actions, our words, our deeds, our thoughts that everything we do would, would represent the King of kings and Lord of lords. And then as we come back to you in prayer, and as we talk to you like we're doing right now, we would know how to talk to you because we know what your will is. We know what pleases you. And we talk to you about the things that please you and satisfy you and the things that you are satisfied in hearing and uh, 
are pleased to answer. So, Father, work in our lives. Make us like your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that is your will. And uh, help us in the difficult moments of life and help us in our prayer life. May we rely more and more and more on your Holy Spirit to pray in and through us that we might have an effective, powerful prayer life for your glory and for the benefit of others as well. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome to the Children's Church. Today we are going to learn about Abraham's wife, whose name is Sarah. Abraham and Sarah are part of the group of Bible heroes who we've been learning about over the last several weeks. Take it away, Mom. Hey, everybody. Great to see you. For the past few weeks, we have been learning about heroes of the faith found in Hebrews 11, men and women that did incredible things for God. When you hear about these people, you may think, what does this have to do with me? These are really superheroes. I mean, David defeated Goliath, who was a literal giant. And Gideon defeated an entire army by just breaking some pots. But these men and women were not superheroes. They were regular guys and gals like you and me. But what they had was a superhero working through them. And that superhero is God. Now, I want to tell you about one hero of the faith. Her name is Sarah. But now, she is no Wonder Woman. And her name wasn't always Sarah. Her name at first was Sarai, which actually means quarrelsome. That, can you imagine that? God changed her name to princess. Much better. Sarah was married to a man named Abraham. And God made an incredible promise to Abraham. He said that Abraham would be the father of a great nation, that his descendants would be as numerous as the, as the stars. This was great news for Sarah, because up until this point, she had not been able to have children. She knew that this meant that, that God would be blessing her with a baby. God told Abraham and Sarah to leave their home and to travel to a land that God would show them. So they packed up their things and they hit the road. On their journey, they had to go through cities. And some of those cities had great, mighty kings. And Abraham got scared. Sarah was a beautiful woman. And Abraham thought, Oh man, when these rulers see how beautiful my wife is, they're going to want to kill me so they can make her their wife. Abraham came up with an idea. He asked Sarah to lie. He wanted her to say that she was his sister instead of his wife. So Sarah had a choice. Would she obey and trust God and tell the truth? Or would she disobey and lie? Well, she chose to disobey and it made a big mess. She told the king that she was his sister. And God, as a result, sent plagues on that land. You may relate. Have you ever been tempted to lie? Maybe because you're scared of what would happen if you told the truth. Or maybe someone else has asked you to lie for them because they're afraid of what might happen if they tell the truth. Well, when we lie, we have a choice to trust God or to disobey and lie. But what Sarah learned is when you lie, when you choose to lie, it just creates a big mess, and it hurts not only you, but others. So Sarah and Abraham left the city. They were actually thrown out by that king. They left the city, and they continued on their journey. God reminded them of the promise that he was going to make Abraham into a great nation. But as they came to another city with a powerful ruler, Abraham got scared again, and he asked Sarah to lie. What do you think she chose to do? Do you think she remembered the mess that happened in the last city and said, no way, I've got to be honest about who I am? Or do you think she lied? What would you do? Well, she chose to disobey, and she lied, just telling the king that she was his sister. And you know what? A big mess happened again. But this time, God sent a dream to that king. And in the dream, he revealed that who Sarah actually was. Have you ever lied and been caught in your lie and thought, can that person read my mind? Well, maybe God helped you get caught in the lie because he loves you so much. He wants you to know that when you don't trust him and tell a lie, it hurts you 
and others, and it creates a big mess. What we need to remember, what Sarah needed to remember, and what Abraham, Abraham needed to remember, is that God is faithful. And when we're faced with those scary situations where we have to decide to tell the truth or to lie, we are not alone. We have a great superhero, God, living inside of us that is going to give us the courage to be honest and to tell the truth. So remember, if you are a daughter or a son of the king, you are a prince and a princess, and you have a mighty superhero living inside of you that is going to give you the courage to be brave and to tell the truth. Be brave this week. Abraham was the son of Terah who lived in a distant land. He had a wife by the name of Sarah. They were really old. God made a promise to Abraham that he would have a son. And from that son would come a nation as many as the stars. Oh. in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Many years went by for them, but still they trusted God. They knew He would fulfill His promise if they just believed. Whoa. in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding in all of your ways. Acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding in all of your ways. Acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Yes, He will direct your path. Abraham and Sarah had a baby boy. God fulfilled his promise just like he said he would. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 is the verse mentioned in that song. It can help us run the race and finish strong, just like the heroes we've been learning about. Let's try and memorize this verse. Will you say as I read it? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Great job! Now try and memorize it. And time for Bible aerobics with Miss Marcia. Hop up and get ready. Get your thumbs up, kids. We're going to do way back in the beginning. Get ready. Way back in the beginning, there was God, and he made the world, and he made two people, Adam and Eve, and he gave them a choice to obey or to disobey. They chose to disobey. That is called the fall. That's when sin came into the world. But God had an idea. He would send part of himself in the form of a baby, his name was Jesus. He died on the cross, was put into the tomb, and on the third day he rose from the dead. He broke the power of sin and death and was seen alive by many people. Then he went up into heaven. But God had another idea. He would send part of himself called the Holy Spirit who could be everywhere and even live in your heart. He stamps us with a special invisible seal. That means we're part of God's family until Jesus comes again from heaven and we meet him in the air to be with him forever and ever and ever. Great job, kids. Thanks for joining us for Children's Church today. Don't forget to register for our online Summer Blast off. Well, it's on.
but it's off because we don't get to be here together and sing and do stuff like that. But but still on. It's still going to be awesome. Have a great week, everyone.